The Red Badge of Courage, an episode of the American Civil War by Stephen Crane. Chapter 6 The youth awakened slowly. He came gradually back to a position from which he could regard himself. For moments he had been scrutinizing his person in a dazed way as if he had never before seen himself. Then he picked up his cap from the ground. He wiggled in the jacket to make a more comfortable fit, and kneeling, replaced his shoe. He thoughtfully mopped his reeking features. So it was over at last. The supreme trial had been passed. The red, formidable difficulties of war had been vanquished. He went into an ecstasy of self-satisfaction. He had the most delightful sensations of his life, standing as if apart from himself. He viewed that last scene. He perceived that the man who had fought thus was magnificent. He felt that he was a fine fellow. He saw himself even with those ideals which he had considered as far beyond him. He smiled in deep gratification. Upon his fellows he beamed tenderness and good will. "'Gee, ain't it hot, eh?' he said affably to a man who was polishing his streaming face with his coat sleeve. "'You bet!' said the other, grinning sociably. i never seen such dumb hotness. He sprawled out luxuriously on the ground. Gee, yes, and I hope we don't have no more fight until a week from Monday. <laughs> there were some handshakings and deep speeches with men whose features were familiar, but with whom the youth now felt the bonds of tied hearts. He helped a cursing comrade to bind up a wound of the shin. But of a sudden, cries of amazement broke out along the ranks of the new regiment. Here they come again! Here they come again! The man who had sprawled upon the ground started up and said, Gosh! The youth turned quick eyes upon the field. He discerned forearms begin to swell in masses out of a distant wood. He again saw the tilted flag speeding forward. The shells, which had ceased to trouble the regiment for a time, came swirling again and exploded in the grass or among the leaves of the trees. They looked to be strange war flowers, bursting into fierce bloom. The men groaned. The luster faded from their eyes. Their smudged countenances now expressed profound dejection. They moved their stiffened bodies slowly and watched in sullen mood the frantic approach of the enemy. The slaves toiling in the template of this god began to feel rebellion at his harsh tasks. They fretted and complained each to each. Oh, say, this is too much of a good thing. Why can't somebody send us supports? We ain't never going to stand this second banging. I didn't come here to fight the whole damn rebel army. There was one who raised a doleful cry. I wish Bill Smithers had trod on my hand instead of treading on his. The sore joints of the regiment creaked as it painfully floundered into position to repulse. The youth stared. Surely, he thought, this impossible thing was not about to happen. He waited as if he expected the enemy to suddenly stop, apologize, and retire, bowing. It was all a mistake. But the firing began somewhere on the regimental line and ripped along in both directions. The level sheets of flame developed great clouds of smoke that tumbled and tossed in the mild wind near the ground for a moment, and then rolled through the ranks as through a gate. The clouds were tinged an earth-like yellow in the sun-rays, and in the shadow they were sorry blue. The flag was sometimes eaten and lost in this mass of vapor, but more often it projected, sun-touched, resplendent. Into the youth's eyes there came a look that one can see in the orbs of a jaded horse. His neck was quivering with nervous weakness, and the muscles of his arms felt numb and bloodless. His hands, too, seemed large and awkward, as if he was wearing invisible mittens, and there was a great uncertainty about his knee-joints. The words that comrades had uttered previously to the firing had begun to recur to him. Oh, say, this is too much of a good thing. What do they take us for? Why don't they send supports? I didn't come here to fight the whole damn rebel army. He began to exaggerate the endurance, the skill, and the valor of those who were coming, himself reeling from exhaustion as he was astonished beyond measure at such persistency. They must be machines of steel. It was very gloomy struggling against such affairs, wound up, perhaps, to fight until sundown. He slowly lifted his rifle and, catching a glimpse of a thick-spread field, he blazed at a cantering cluster. He stopped then and began to peer as best he could through the smoke. He caught changing views of the ground, covered with men who were all running like pursued imps and yelling. 
To the youth it was an onslaught of redoubtable dragons. He became like a man who lost his legs at the approach of the red and green monster. He waited in a sort of a horrified, listening attitude. He seemed to shut his eyes and wait to be cobbled. A man near him, who up to this time had been working feverishly at his rifle, suddenly stopped and ran with howls. The lad whose face had borne the expression of exalted courage, the majesty of he who dares give his life, was at an instant smitten abject. He blanched like one who has come to the edge of a cliff at midnight, and is suddenly made aware. There was a revelation. He, too, threw down his gun and fled. There was no shame in his face. He ran like a rabbit. Others began to scamper away through the smoke. The youth turned his head, shaken from his trance by this movement, as if the regiment was leaving him behind. He saw the few fleeting forms. He yelled, then with fright, and swung about. For a moment, in the great clamor, he was like a proverbial chicken. He lost the direction of safety. Destruction threatened him from all points. Directly, he began to speed toward the rear in great leaps. His rifle and cap were gone. His unbuttoned coat bulged in the wind. The flap of his cartridge box bobbed wildly, and his canteen, by its slender cord, swung out behind. On his face was all the horror of those things which he imagined. The lieutenant sprang forward, bawling. The youth saw his features wrathfully red, and saw him make a stab with his sword. His one thought of the incident was that the lieutenant was a peculiar creature to feel interested in such matters upon this occasion. He ran like a blind man. Two or three times he fell down. Once he knocked his shoulder so heavily against a tree that he went headlong. Since he had turned his back upon the fight, his fears had been wondrously magnified. Death about to thrust him between the shoulder blades was far more dreadful than death about to smite him between the eyes. When he thought of it later, he conceived the impression that it is better to view the appalling than to be merely within hearing. The noises of the battle were like stones. He believed himself liable to be crushed. As he ran on, he mingled with others. He dimly saw one man on his right and on his left, and he heard footsteps behind him. He thought that all the regiment was fleeing, pursued by these ominous crashes. In his flight, the sound of these following footsteps gave him his one meager relief. He felt vaguely that death must make a first choice of the men who were nearest. The initial morsels for the dragons would be then those who were following him. So he displayed the zeal of an insane sprinter in his purpose to keep them in the rear. There was a race. As he, leading, went across a little field, he found himself in a region of shells. They hurtled over his head with long, wild screams. As he listened, he imagined them to have rows of cruel teeth that grinned at him. Once, one lit before him, and the livid lightning of the explosion effectively barred the way in his chosen direction. He groveled on the ground, and then, springing up, went careening off through some bushes. He experienced a thrill of amazement when he came within view of a battery in action. The men there seemed to be in conventional moods altogether unaware of the impending annihilation. The battery was disputing with a distant antagonist, and the gunners were wrapped in admiration of their shooting. They were continually bending in coasting postures over the guns. They seemed to be patting them on the back and encouraging them with words. The guns, stolid and undaunted, spoke with dogged valor. The precise gunners were coolly enthusiastic. They lifted their eyes every chance to the smoke-wreathed hillock, from whence the hostile battery addressed them. The youth pitied them as he ran. Methodical idiots, machine-like fools! The refined joy of planting shells in the midst of the other battery's formation would appear a little thing when the infantry came swooping out of the woods. The face of a youthful rider, who was jerking his frantic horse with an abandon of temper, he might display in a placid barnyard, was impressed deeply upon his mind. He knew that he looked upon a man who would presently be dead. Too, he felt a pity for the gun standing six good comrades in a bold row. He saw a brigade going to the relief of its pestered fellows. He scrambled upon a wee hill and watched it sweeping finely, keeping information in difficult places. The blue of the line was crusted with steel color and the brilliant flanks projected. Officers were shouting. This sight also filled him with wonder. The brigade was hurrying briskly to be gulped into the infernal mouth of the war-god. What manner of men were they, anyhow? 
Ah, it was some wondrous breed, or else they didn't comprehend, the fools. A furious order caused commotion in the artillery. An officer on a bounding horse made maniacal motions with his arms. The teams went swinging up from the rear. The guns were whirled about, and the battery scampered away. The cannon, with their noses poked slantingly at the ground, grunted and grumbled like stout men, brave but with objections to hurry. The youth went on, moderating his pace, since he had left the place of noises. Later he came upon a general of division, seated upon a horse that pricked its ears in an interested way at the battle. There was a great gleaming of yellow and patent leather about the saddle and bridle. The quiet man astride looked mouse-colored upon such a splendid charger. A jingling staff was galloping hither and thither. Sometimes the general was surrounded by horsemen, and at other times he was quite alone. He looked to be much harassed. He had the appearance of a businessman whose market is swinging up and down. The youth went slinking around this spot. He went as near as he dared, trying to overhear words. Perhaps the general, unable to comprehend chaos, might call upon him for information, and he could tell him. He knew all concerning it. Of a surety the force was in a fix, and any fool could see that if they did not retreat while they had opportunity, why, he felt that he would like to thrash the general, or at least approach and tell him in plain words exactly what he thought him to be. It was criminal to stay calmly in one spot and make no effort to stay destruction. He loitered in a fever of eagerness for the division commander to apply to him. As he warily moved about, he heard the general call out irritably, "'Tompkins, go over and see Taylor, and tell him not to be in such an all-fired hurry. Tell him to halt his brigade in the edge of the woods. Tell him to detach a regiment. Say, I think the center'll break if we don't help out some. Tell him to hurry up.' A slim youth on a fine chestnut horse caught those swift words from the mouth of his superior. He made his horse bound into a gallop, almost from a walk, in his haste to go upon his mission. There was a cloud of dust. A moment later the youth saw the general bounce excitedly in his saddle. "'Yes, by heavens! They have!' The officer leaned forward. His face was aflame with excitement. "'Yes, by heaven, they've held him! They've held him!' He began to blithely roar at his staff. "'We'll wallop him now! We'll wallop him now! We've got him sure!' He turned suddenly to an aide. "'Here, you! Jones, quick! Right after Tompkins!' See, Taylor, tell him to go in everlastingly like blazes, anything. As another officer sped his horse after the first messenger, the general beamed upon the earth like a sun. In his eyes was a desire to chant a pan. He kept repeating, They've held him! By heavens! His excitement made his horse plunge, and he merrily kicked and swore at it. He held a little carnival of joy on horseback. End of chapter 6